It is September the 2nd, 2021, and you're watching Curiously Polar. Look who's back. We're all back. Yay! What a break. We had quite a bit of a break, so... um, <laughs> <laughs> The second longest break in Curiously Polar history, isn't it? I th yeah. think and it th is. And this, time is, this time is not my fault. This well, True. it is it is partially related to you, but that is okay. <laughs> Let's all play Mario. Um, yeah, it's good to be back. We are back with a vengeance, and we are um, going to kick this right off with some news that have accumulated over the last weeks. Um, our polar newsreel begins on the northernmost tip of Greenland. What is this new island all about? I saw this at least on three different media streams. Um, it was apparently a big deal. What kind of a big deal is it? Here's the, the Guardian writing ab about it. Um, what kind of a big yeah, deal this is, is this? Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, fantastic. It's one of those things that makes you think that uh, the era of discoveries in the polar region is not finished. And, uh, and this was also how uh, my uh, good friend Morten Rasch, who was, uh, he was also interviewed in this article, described this in his, uh, in his Facebook uh, uh, stream or his Facebook posts, that they were looking for uh, Okak uh, Island, which is... Uh, which has been discovered uh, in the 70s, at the end of the 70s, as in, in recognized and recognized as, as an island and as being the northernmost uh, island in the world, uh -huh. just north of the north coast of Greenland in the ice. And it's a place, of course, that uh, very few people have, uh, have set foot on. <laughs> and uh, and they, were, they were going, they had some GPS coordinates and... Uh, flying with a helicopter in this uh, Swiss-Danish expedition, they actually landed on the wrong island. And this new island, I mean, I say island with uh, quotes because it's actually a mud bank and uh, it's, it's it a, might be that it disappears <laughs> and it's in the ice as you've seen the pictures in the in the news there. So, but so they it landed is, in this mud flat. It is, and, it is uh, 30 it is meters across, as it says here. So Yes, uh, exactly. 30 <laughs> meters across. For, but it's still, it's, it's a merged land. It's separate from Okaka Island. And uh, they uh, actually uh, think that uh, it should have its own name. <laughs> and it's really difficult to, to um, determine islands there in the area because you have mm. the, the sea ice all around usually, right? So it's, it's really difficult to see um, if a place is actually covered with sea ice or with ice. Is it a landmass? Is it the same landmass or is it a different one? Is it, uh, is, is, what is the official definition for, for an island? Is it it's a landmass yeah. surrounded by water? Yeah, yeah but, exactly. but, but isn't there a minimum size or, or volume or I don't know? I, I I wonder, but uh, I mean the uh, the British have been uh, have been battling for rock hall and uh, as an island or as a rock or something for defining the uh, territorial waters as a, as an example closer to home for most Europeans. I mean, an island is important for defining the territorial waters, and uh, and the more you press your territorial waters, the more uh, e exclusive economic zone you have. So it's it's actually quite a quite an important. Uh, claim for Denmark and for Greenland. I and see. I must correct myself, it was Odak Island, not Okak Island, okay. the previous one. So is that is that something fairly, is that something it's usual? Very important is in, it important? In, in regards also to the um, territory claim of the North Pole, right? We ha we still have the ongoing discussion there with the Russian claim of the uh, Lomonosov Ridge and um, the counterclaims from Canada and Greenland slash Denmark, uh, um, yeah, slash Denmark, and this island would be the northernmost landmass um, submerging the water. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty hmm. um, a pretty important support for the claim. Then, I think I think that uh, this is uh, actually a good uh, a good interesting topic for our next episode. <laughs> because, <Yes. laughs> because there are lots of uh, lots of uh, talks about this. Yeah. Luckily, just talks for the moment. Yeah. But in any case, just to finish this off before we go to the next one, they recommend the name. And here I have to read Kurtak Avanarslek. So the northernmost island in Greenlandic for this new <laughs> sandbank. It's so, very creative. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I think they will not have loads of tourists going up there and having to order a charter flight to Kjartak oh. Avarnaslek. You know, uh, you know Avarnaslek. how many how many people will make uh, make the drive up to the North Cup in uh, in Norway. So <laughs> yeah, but the the problem is that the North Cup has actually some some uh, subsistence under underneath. Um, so it's it's substantial. Yeah, but and uh, from, from yeah, what yeah, I the bank you, actually is. From what I there hear is, is a bar, there is a cafe. Yeah, but from what cake. I hear is it is very very boring and uh, it's mainly a claim to a bragging rights thing. So. It, and it will disappear very likely in, in, in about a year or two, or who knows how, uh, whenever. It's <laughs> it's literally a moraine, and um, yes. that's just very much affected by the current, by the by the water movement, by the ice movement. So it might just disappear very quickly. Okay. Yeah. Next up the in ice. the uh, Polar Newsreel, um, I haven't really followed this one. So uh, d- d- the uh, headline here from Unis.no says: Dramatic temperature rises in the Arctic hits vital sea ice. Algae. Well, this is uh, this is a publication uh, from the uh, university in Svalbard, UNIS, and it's about a project, a project that is uh, is uh, studied algae, and uh, algae in the Arctic can be phytoplankton. And can also be ice algae, so algae that grow on the surface of the ice and in the melt water from the uh, sea ice. So what they tried to do is to uh, uh, check uh, and um, set in experimental conditions in a lab, so sample the algae and then take them over in a lab, and then find out what would happen to the reproduction, to the photosynthesis, and to the dimensions of these algae set into a, a warming scenario. So with the thinner sea ice, you have more light coming into the sea and you also have a change in the stratification of the water because the ice melting would stratify the water differently there would be less mixing between the layers of water and what they found out is that phytoplankton is quite adaptable to the uh, changes and would uh, uh, let's say pass almost unscathed through the <laughs> through these changes but the ice algae which are a big part of the uh, of the productivity of the primary productivity of the arctic actually do suffer quite a lot by this increase in light and uh, in, uh, like uh, the stratification of the uh, of the seawater and they decrease their production of oxygen or co2 consumption thus contributing in the uh, acidification of the water and uh, and also uh, diminishing the the primary production and therefore the basis for the ecosystem. Hmm. That's not so Sorry, good. Sorry, don't 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 look so so gloom. But it's <laughs> it's it's not it's not good it's not good for the ice algae. But uh, of course, all of these data have to be included into a modeling of what would happen. And uh, like it might be that the phytoplankton would take over and produce mm. more. But ice algae as a group might be reduced to a, a minor role. How big are the uh, ice algae percentage-wise compared to the other factors in this? Oh my gosh! Yes, like you caught you caught me unprepared. <laughs> you didn't do your I, research. I, okay, <laughs> I didn't do my research on ice algae. <laughs> I mean, it's always a question. An effect uh, always depends on how big uh, the the contribution well, is. It's actually it's actually difficult to, to estimate. It's uh, it's very difficult to estimate these uh, these things because uh, you usually talk about biomass mm-hmm. and uh, and biomass in a vegetation, especially in the ocean, is estimated on a uh, like looking at the surface and the uh, and the uh, chlorophyll signature from satellite images. Yeah. So you can have a, an area that is more or less ex- uh, dense with chlorophyll. And the different algae have different uh, signatures for chlorophylls. Uh, sometimes you can have instruments also, maybe not from satellite, from airplanes. And uh, and this is something that uh, is not, uh, these data are not uh, present simultaneously for the whole Arctic. And therefore, like the modeling of what happens in the Arctic is very complex. All right. Uh, next up in the newsreel, oh, this is one. This is one uh, for me. This is one for me. The Robo Penguin also has been uh, has come across different media streams for me. Um, what's up with uh, with uh, building a penguin? This is an article uh, again in the Guardian. So, 
Yes. Well, uh, this is a, an interview with uh, Bukhard Bashek, uh, who has now become the uh, director of the uh, Oceano, uh, what's it, the German Oceanographic Museum in Stralsund recently. Mm-hmm. So, congratulations to him taking uh, taking over uh, the uh, role of this uh, very nice institution. But he's an oceanographer, and he has been studying the uh, dynamics of the ocean. He has been losing a lot of equipment. Uh, in doing so because normally you'll have an equipment that is uh, uh, that is towed behind a ship so you'll have a line between the equipment and the ship and uh, and this line can be fouled can break and and this so he has been instrumental in uh, developing this uh, autonomous underwater vehicle oh it is autonomous and, uh, so it does its exactly. own exactly oh that is a exactly. difference yes so the the quadroin is like a quadru like quattro like for the uh, four propellers that it's, they have it's in like the back. It's like one of and those the, flying drones, but in the water, yes, pretty much. Exactly, and and then oin is from the penguin penguin like the <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce this thing <laughs> originally, but the quadroin. Yes, anyways, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and there are there is this one thing that is interesting is that. It has a shape of a penguin, and the penguin is an extremely hydrodynamic shape. So they chose this shape, and also the colors uh, for uh, for this. Um, the other important thing that I find is that it is not tethered; it is doesn't have any cables. And what they use, and this is for the uh, for the marine mammalogist in me, is that they use sounds for communicating <sighs> with the instrument. And they use sounds like dolphins. So it does it does swim like a penguin and speak like a dolphin. It swims like a penguin and so, for and for the dolphins in the water it sounds very strange, I would think. Um Yes, but exactly. Autonomous means it's not remote controlled. It gets programmed to well, do something, or is it a remote controlled vehicle? Well, I think that it's uh, it can it can do both. I mean, it doesn't say in this in this article. I'm really mm-hmm. looking forward to see hearing more about this and uh, what it does. But another interesting characteristics of these is that they can be programmed to um, to dock when, for example, the weather is not good and uh, the conditions are not uh, are not uh, optimal for the data sampling. So these are instruments, these uh, these drones, underwater drones, they have instruments for uh, measuring the usual uh, temperature, salinity, conductivity, the, the CTDs and high conductivity temperature and, uh, and density of the water. Uh, but uh, the conditions at which they have to go out vary, and especially these are made for going into the eddies uh, in uh, in difficult uh, difficult situations uh, where there are rocks around, maybe up in northern Greenland, for example, and uh, and they can dock and uh, recharge batteries and also wait until the conditions are good. It's like an underwater so Roomba. Really nice. Yeah, it goes out, it does some vacuum cleaning, yes. some some sample <laughs> collecting, and then comes exactly. back and docks and charges. Awesome. By the way, in the article, I also read that there's um, that it's three D printed, so they are using. Very modern uh, manufacturing technology here, which is yes, and this is cool. uh, this is German made with highest uh, possible technology, <laughs> and it uh, it comes also with a with a nice price tag of eighty thousand euros <laughs> b- a piece. But uh, yeah. so it's a little more surprised. than your Roomba, I suppose. I'm not surprised. But, uh, yeah, ah, cool. But the, but the outcome, the the, the the promised outcome, is also um, worth the investment. So. Yeah. If if we look at the the goal of the research for um, that piece of equipment, then we have to understand that we don't know much about those eddies. Um, eddies are small currents, and we understand the bigger picture of ocean currents, and we understand how they interact with each other. But what we don't really understand, and what's what's really lacking, is um, how eddies are formed and how eddies are actually influencing bigger currents and how they are changing bigger currents. And that's exactly what this uh, yeah equipment wants to uh, understand and to, to research. And I'm really looking forward for uh, the first results of it. Eddie. Yes, exactly. And to just underline the importance of these eddies, these are the most productive areas in the ocean. Yes. And when I see productive, I see also primary production. And to link it with the previous article, phytoplankton actually produces far more oxygen and captures far more CO2 than all of the land plants 
So uh, it is very important for also regulating climate change and uh, for our survival. Cool. So, uh, by the way, the 80,000 euro price tag uh, is is a very relative one. It says here in the article that uh, the that, that would be roughly the same as the cost of hiring a fully equipped research vessel for just one day. So I think yes. that uh, quickly amortizes. So... Uh, with that, uh, next up in the newsreel, um, rain in Greenland. What's that about, Henry? It, it's actually about rain in Greenland. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that unusual? Um, uh, it is unusual where it was detected, and that's the summit um, of the Greenlandic ice sheet. And the summit is basically uh, where we have the ice divide. It's the highest point of the ice sheet. From there on, we have the um, glacial movement all the way downward to, towards the coast. And as long as mankind is present on the ice sheet in Greenland, there has never been rain on the summit. So the scientists are pretty much surprised by um, nine days um, uh, consecutive um, positive temperatures, so above um, zero. Mm -hmm. And that was only the third time that they measured um, above zero um, temperatures on the summit uh, station. And it's the very, very first time that there was no snowfall, but actually rain. And that changes um, a lot in the picture. It shows a, a very dramatic development um, on Iceland because you have a very, very strong microclimate influence by the ice sheet. And if that microclimate um, stays in sub-zero degrees for a significant amount of time, and we're talking here about nine days, um, that's quite a, um, a huge impact, then we see that something is not working very well with the microclimate. And yeah. if we have rain over um, over the ice sheet, that means that the, the rainwater is much warmer than the snow that actually is covering the, the top layer of the ice sheet and, um, and the, the, the fern and the ice layers underneath. So it causes a melt. Um, additionally to the surface temperatures um, which are present um, in the first place. So we have uh, a bigger impact there. And that uh, uh, was a very important news when that came out. So it uh, yes. was end of August. Yeah. Mm. A little errata, you said Iceland at one point. Oh, sorry. I think you meant Greenland. <laughs> but, uh, yes, just, That's what just, happens. Just to, make sure, just to make sure, because some of our listeners will definitely pick up on this. So we just put a disclaimer here. But, uh, but you're right. <laughs> I mean, you. this is... This is extremely, extremely important. And Greenland has, uh, we already mentioned uh, in previous episodes uh, earlier this year, that uh, Greenland is melting very fast and uh, the mass balance is negative. And so far, that was actually really the, the exception of the rule. It was really um, the summit was kind of the safe bet and you uh, still had an accumulation of, uh, of new ice um, on, on the summit station. And now we actually have for the first time uh, rain. Um, it's not the end of the world. Um, it doesn't mean that we now, from now on have the rain uh, once a month or once a year, but it shows uh, a trend which we already see on other uh, places all over the ice sheet, particularly at the coastlines. Uh, they are much, much more dramatic. But if that trend goes on, then we certainly see more rain phases on top of the ice sheet. Right. Yes. A little bit like here in Tromsø, where we have had rain practically the whole summer. <laughs> Hmm. Okay, uh, staying with ice, last uh, item on the Polar Newsreel list is um, A74. Is that the we're one back. that is that the one that we talked about yes. earlier? So A74, yes. we're talking about a big iceberg and it is on the move. And uh, BBC writes, giant iceberg A74 kisses the Antarctic coast. Um, so... Nice. Let's set the frame. Let's set the frame first. <laughs> yes, let's A74, do this. A74, we talked about in previous episodes, that's the, the last um, big carving event um, on Antarctic ice shelves. That's the one that actually carved off um, northeast of the Brunt ice shelf. And it's very close to the British Antarctic Survey research station Halley 6. And what actually happened, it doesn't really kiss the coast. It actually kissed the remains of the Brunt ice shelf. Oh, you can see okay. on the satellite pictures here on the screen, um, the white 
triangle on on the top right that's the iceberg a74 and the bottom right corner um if you're just listening to the podcast just swap over to youtube it's really worth it um you see the edge of the Brontë shell that's the, the the long nose there and you can see the long crack and we also talked um excessively about the Brontë shelf in a number of episodes because that crack actually has formed over 10 15 years it has um, gained quite some speed. It has formed two, three more cracks. And actually, the last formed crack has produced the iceberg A74. And now what had happened or what could have happened is that the A74 iceberg collision with the Brondi shelf could have triggered more uh, carvings. So the, it could have caused an instability to the Brondi ice shelf. And that's quite dangerous because... We have still, even though it's not um, in, in use at the moment, the research station on the Bront Ice Shelf. It is east of the huge crack, so it is kind of in a, in a kind of safe area um, with quotation marks. But um, you never really know what the impact will be of uh, such a large iceberg um, hitting the ice shelf. So it could actually um, break off a larger piece of uh, the iceberg uh, of the ice shelf than uh, previously um, assumed um, whatsoever the crack we've seen in the satellite picture um, marks another area of the Bronte shelf which is pretty much the same size a74 is similar to the greater london area for um for most people to get a, a slight idea and if we have a second iceberg coming from uh, from the same um, size that would actually change a little bit dynamics um, in the area in the Brond ice shelf in particular is blocking three large glaciers coming down from Antarctica so there would be quite some um, you know, dynamic change in the movement of the ice how can that happen well it's basically ocean currents and that's uh, again what we don't understand um, well enough there have been some a very strong easterly winds coming uh, down into the Wajel Sea, and they caused um, a huge um, uh, pickup of speed in the currents, and they actually drove A74 faster than previously. It stayed quite uh, in, in place for, um, I think, yeah, three, four months now, and um, yeah, actually just moved a tremendous piece um, further and hit the westerly edge of the Brundtland Shelf. Quite an interesting time for the people at Halley. Yes. Well, there, there luckily is no one. Um, so the station is um, evacuated since the beginning of COVID. Um, because due to COVID, the evacuation uh, procedures would have been even more difficult um, to maintain. So there was in the Antarctic summer last, uh, the last summer was um, some maintenance personnel there. Um, but right now, as far as I know, there should be no one on, on that station. Okay, yeah. icebergs in motion. Um, I think that concludes our Polar Newsreel. Let us go to our main topic. And this has been on every single news outlet in the world, I think. Uh, we're, of course, talking about the IPCC report. And, uh, yeah. So, yes. Where, where do we start? So where do we start? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe a quick explanation what it's about. A quick explanation. The IPCC, I suppose that uh, we all know, it's an intergovernmental panel on climate change. And uh, it is a, uh, a group of, uh, well, it is an organization that uh, produces a report that has been tasked to produce a report on climate change. So it's a, it's a global it's a global organ uh, under the uh, auspices of the United Nations that uh, produces an assessment of the climate and where we're going. And uh, we are at the sixth cycle. So this is the uh, assessment report six for the, uh, for the, um, for the IPCC. And uh, this report has a technical part and then uh, a more popular part, or is a summary for policymaker, for policymakers, which is addressing the wider population. And then there are press releases that are more for the wider, wider public. 
So all the details are in there. And, uh, and this uh, uh, climate ch change report is uh, actually, this uh, sixth assessment report is divided in three parts. Now, the, f the one that has been just uh, released is about the physical science basis. So it is about what are we observing of climate change. And there are two more that parts that are coming out and are planned for 2022. And there is one about the the uh, uh, impacts and adaptation and vulnerability, so the actual effects of climate change on the earth and the uh, humans and the uh, ecosystems and everything that goes with it. And, and then there is also another part, which is going to be extremely interesting, which is actually looking at the mitigations of climate change. And, uh, and these two parts, as I said before, they are going to be available next year if everything goes according to the plan. So, so we have these, and then there is going to be a synthesis as well produced at the end of next year, which is the last part of the process. And the synthesis will, put, will pull everything together and uh, find out where we are. And uh, one of the uh, basis of the work is checking whether the uh, whether humanity can reach or whether the parties that have agreed can reach the uh, uh, Paris Agreement uh, goal of limiting uh, the uh, warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, more than uh, than the uh, than the uh, previous average and and here we have uh, quite uh, quite uh, some uh, some thoughts. It's clear it, messages. It is a clear it, message here yes. that something needs to be done now, not in the future, if we need to reach the Paris Agreement and uh, that's, that's goals. That's probably the, the most important outcome of this um, report is what the report contains is no news. Nothing here is new to us. Nothing there has been uh, never been mentioned before. It's all known. We expected what's in there. We actually knew pretty much what's in there. Um, the 195 countries um, which come together in the IPCC, they have basically analyzed the climate research um, until the uh, 31st January of, um, of this year, of 2021. So they came to a conclusion and the conclusion of the IPCC um, report is that they used for the very first time a very, very strong language. Usually scientists tend to be very, very careful how they uh, communicate. They want to um, make sure that people understand that science is a living being. It constantly needs to be checked and um, uh, re-evaluated, uh, reassessed. And then you can come to um, a more detailed um, result or possibly even to a different result. But what ha has happened here since the 1970s, we know about climate change, we know about the impact of uh, mankind and in, in induced uh, climate change. And nothing of that has ever been rejected. No model has been proven wrong. Um, the opposite is the case. What has happened is that we gained more data, that we, we, ha we, had, we gained the ability to actually forecast more in detail. And still, all those forecasts, all those models have been very, very conservative from, from the scientific point of view, meaning they all have been cashed in by reality and they have all been topped up um, by reality. So we see that the models we have in place are working. The um, assumptions that are made are realistic, but the wording chosen by scientists saying that something is more likely or less likely causes um, very, very often reason for debate by populists who use that as, yeah, more likely doesn't really mean it's urgent. And this is really the change in this report. This time it actually wor uh, uses a very definite language and it, wor it uses words like unequivocal, which is like a very, very strong word that leaves no doubt it is not debatable. It's clear that we have a man-induced uh, climate change. And that's that's very very new. It's something that scientists don't tend to do. Yes, and uh, and I uh, I think that uh, this is for the global perspective. There is no region of the globe that is unaffected. Uh, so there are different ways that uh, these things are happening for our 
area of interest, uh, special area of interest, uh, which are the polar areas, we can see that the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the globe. So we, uh, the IPCC says two, and now the uh, we looked at the uh, ministerial declaration for the Arctic Council, they said three. The actual difference is in the decimals in there. Now we are using integers, the the two estimates actually are actually quite close and uh, and partly is uh, uh, also due to the fact that the IPCC uses slightly older data now you said the data gathered until the 1st of uh, of January 2021 uh, we are actually looking at uh, very small differences in in the data and the later the later data are even more even more pointing towards this faster warming of the Arctic. And, uh, and also like uh, uh, what we see uh, in, uh, in this report is that uh, we are going to be having changes in the water cycle. And this is of course also uh, affecting the Arctic because uh, like you're seeing, we've seen this uh, Greenland uh, summit uh, rain. We uh, will have the uh, sea level rise because of the melting of the land ice masses. And here we again, we get Greenland and Antarctica in this. Uh, we'll have permafrost thawing and the increase in release of uh, greenhouse gases like methane from the tundra and uh, the increase in wildfires like we've seen now in Siberia. Now we didn't put in the newsreel, but uh, there have been intensive uh, wildfires all through the Arctic, but especially in uh, in Siberia, in and Alaska the, in, and Canada as in, well. Yeah. In Alaska and Canada, uh, this has been also something that uh, increases the uh, the uh, amount of black carbon, so the carbon in the atmosphere, and uh, deposited on the uh, on the snow and the ice that uh, remains over the summer, so decreasing the albedo of the planet. And uh, and there are uh, changes in the ocean currents, and the uh, and these uh, changes in the ocean currents also come up uh, to the polar areas or down to the polar areas. Uh, in if you're talking the Antarctica, and so, all of so that is is very obvious. Uh, it is very very clear. It doesn't leave room for negotiation for debate anymore, and that's where the IPCC uh, authors of that uh, of that report actually really went into uh, a very clear uh, terminology. And uh, Chris, if you can put up the, the, the first quote we, we picked up from, uh, from that report, which very, very clearly says that it is an unequivocal um, that, that human influence has warmed the atmosphere. It is kind of, it's, it's non-debatable. It really sa says very, very clearly it's non-debatable. There's no room for negotiations on that. So that shows how certain scientists are and how well they also understand over the years that you actually need to be very careful with your language to not give room for debate on something that is very, very clear shown in the data. And there is literally no scientific research paper out there that actually negates that. And that's something we see more and more frequent happening uh, in science communication. I found one thing interesting, um, and that's probably from about two weeks ago. Um, it said in some news that uh, the third part of the IPCC report was before it was officially published, it was leaked by the scientists um, because they were fearing the governments to whitewash it, to dilute it in some way. Um, but this is the interesting, interesting part here. So this terminology is not only in the report, that's also in the summary uh, for policymakers. And the summary for policymakers is something which the 195 governments are actually approved sentence by sentence. There's really a long negotiation process going on in that. So if you just see that 195 uh, countries, including the United States, including Russia, including China, including uh, Libya, they all agree on though that very strong terminology then you see there is a big understanding for that but still um if you see the position of uh, scientists they probably would have um chosen uh, a more frequent mentioning of that hard uh, terminology and in, in that regard i do understand um the fears of uh, scientists of, of whitewashing of greenwashing 
there we've seen the negotiations were still very very hard there is an agreement that it's man induced but still there's a lot of room for a negotiation um, if we look at the carbon dioxide emissions since Kyoto Protocol 1992, you see there is literally no reduction happened at all. And that was the first time when uh, the world community came together and agreed of reducing um, emissions. And the same pattern just happened after uh, the Paris Agreement. So we have the beautiful accords that uh, are very, very often referred to. But in, in fact, the um, amount of emission has just continued to rise. Yeah, and uh, we do have uh, we do have uh, a very interesting next step, which is exactly like what are the going to be the effects? And here, like a lot of people might have noticed that uh, there are in the news uh, uh, information about the weather, and of course, the weather is not the climate, but the uh, these information about the climate actually forecast that extreme weather events are going to be or unusual weather is going to be more frequent well they are so already get... here as we could see this summer almost exactly. uh, in so many places in the world there was flooding there's the fires in in yeah. that's, russia that's and so on. A, that's a very important thing right so far in in uh, science or climate change communication we try to explain the science behind climate change. We try to convince people to make them understand. But we also tend, particularly in the podcast here, where we focus uh, on the polar regions, we try to say what happened in the polar region doesn't stay in the polar regions. But it is very, very abstract for the vast majority of people. They can't really relate to what does it actually mean for me if the Arctic sea ice disappears. And if we tell them the, scientific, uh, the, the science behind it and scientific evidence and the facts, it's still does not resonate to them. So what happens now is that the very dramatic weather changes, they now reach the so-called developed countries. So it's not any longer far, far away on a remote Pacific island or in development countries somewhere in Southeast Asia or in Africa. It actually hits at the core of so-called developed countries. So we see weather extremes like the polar vortex uh, on the east coast of uh, the United States. We see suddenly floodings all over Europe, starting in the UK, going all the way down to the Mediterranean. At the same time, we see fires, dramatic fires all over the coast of the Mediterranean. And those fires no longer only um, threaten small villages, they actually are at the front door of capital cities like Athens. Yep. And that's that's a dramatic change, and that might help us to relate to people that what happens actually is real, and that's the outcome of that. So when we talk about climate change, we usually claim or say something like, um, it, until 2100, that and that might happen, or two-degree weather change um, until 2100. What we actually now can explain is climate change is here. It's happening right now. It's happening in your neighborhood, in your village. And, and that I, changes the narrative. And I think it's important mm. that that yeah. uh, the the um, the percentage, the, the likelihood of things is pretty much being taken out as in, um, oh, it, there's a 20% chance that it could not happen, so let's not do anything. Yeah. I've just recently seen news, um, uh, news reels from 1985 where scientists were already pretty much on to the point predicting what's happening now. And uh, yes. I, I think people need proof. That's what I think we learn here. Yes. People need to see it happening to themselves before they start uh, becoming active in this in this respect. And and we have also uh, the increase in frequency of extreme events, like you say, the floodings or the uh, fires, yeah. uh, things that uh, one could have a, an insurance on. Like if you are... If you are living in uh, in Switzerland and uh, the increase in the flooding is happening, then the insurance costs might go up, and that's also one way where people are going to be seeing. Oh, it, it, it will definitely it's on the, it's have on the final economical bill impact. Absolutely, economical impact. Yeah. Absolutely, and not only economical; it also has a societal impact because it um, increases the divide between the rich and the poor because the poor simply can't afford those kind of insurances, so they lose everything and they can't uh, get their money back on on those um, uh, weather patterns. So there there is a huge development in there, and I hope that we now actually, since we are personally affected in the mid-latitudes now can actually move on 
towards uh, activism. And just to come to a positive outlook of that, because I really think there there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, um, if you look at the ice cores in Greenland, almost all the trace gases you can find in the um, in, in the ice in the green, um, the ice cores, and what you can see very very clearly is a few thousand years ago, um, you have little blips um, of lead showed up in in in, in, in sediment cores. That means that you can actually see where the Romans started uh, melting ore to create silver. Really? And yes, you can see that. Yes. And you can see even worse in more recent cores, um, you see the bigger lat traces from fumes of the Industrial Revolution, which began around the 1700s. And then even more in cores from 20th century, you can see the unmistakable fingerprint from leaded gasoline coming through. And yet... There's something that's super, super interesting. Something happened in the 1980s. The leak traces in the ice mostly yeah. disappear. Yeah. And yeah. do you know why? Because we, we turned it off. switched to unleaded gas, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, actually it's, uh, wasn't it uh, yesterday or something where Algeria, the last country to have leaded fuel, has actually finished all of its leaded fuel and now there is no more country. But leaded fuel it, is not produced and there is no more leaded fuel. Isn't it also amazing how long it takes to make some changes like these uh, on a global years, level? Yeah. Wow. It does, and this is why the uh, actually in the IPCC reports that they are coming uh, these uh, these uh, uh, the other parts of the uh, of the AR six, we are going to be getting a not only a description of the effects of climate change, but also uh, recipes, mitigation measures. What can we do to, let's say, help in keeping climate change to a reasonable level? and reduce uh, the speed at which it goes but also like what can we do to bring back the uh, the solutions i watched recently uh, ice on fire uh, this documentary uh, and uh, and in there i think that the, the the good thing is is that somebody is actually thinking about what to do to reduce climate gases from the atmosphere to capture CO2 and put it in the ground to reduce the emission of methane from uh, extraction of natural gases uh, plants. I mean, there are, we have the possibility of doing it. It's just not economically feasible yet or economically be, how do you say, you can't turn money on that. You have to spend money on it. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's actually there where the key is, is trying to make it so clear that governments and not only the population, not only the manos and the humans that are walking the streets, but also the governments and the big industry is actually going in for, for actually doing something about climate change. And that's a very, very important part of the uh, way we need to change the narrative at the moment. We need to stop talking about the doomsday um, outcome of climate change. It's clear. We know about that. And that's not going to change. It only uh, is going to change if we can convince people to take action. And by that, we just need to focus on the positive narrative and speak about the solution we already have at hand. They're there. We just have to use them. We have amazing projects already in place. And there are people um, who already give their um, whole time in giving up their jobs and just invest uh, their time yes. and lives into those amazing projects. We need to talk more about those and we need to get people involved in their neighborhoods again. We really need to build up communities just from the bottom up and if we can come together as communities again, as neighborhoods, as societies, then we actually can achieve really what we want. It's really... Um, very important that we stop pretending there will be some magical future technolo uh, technological solution that's just popping up at a point and solves all our problems. It's just not yeah. happening. And even if it happens, it might be way too late for that. And uh, so, if, if, if anyone feels like there's nothing I can do, we are the people who vote politicians into office, but, also, but also out of office. So, yes. Um, yeah. Very, very important. And, and one, one, one thing that uh, is uh, come out in psychology is there is climate grieving and people are getting depression from getting and anxiety, all of these yes. and anxiety of from, from all of this. And, and uh, it is important also to give a message of and a direction of where we can go and what we can do. Because right. when reading the, uh, the news, it can be quite dire. 
But actually, um, coming back to what Chris just said, that's the, the most important tool we have at hand, right? Uh, I hear very, very often from friends, from colleagues, uh, what can I do as a single person? Um, if I change my diet and become vegan, um, does that actually have an impact? Yeah. It probably doesn't have the impact we we uh, we wanted to have. We, we could do an entire we could do an entire episode on the word. Uh, Climate footprint, individual climate footprint, which is a fabrication of uh, of British petrol. But um, so, I but think the most important impact we actually have is by facilitating our voice in political yes. uh, processes. We yes. we live in so the three of us. We we are race and we live mm -hmm. in uh, democratic cultures, and it's not a very high percentage of people. Um, on that planet who actually can say that. So those who are, they have a very, very important role and they have really this uh, responsibility for others who can't take that chance. And you have to take your possibility to actually cast your vote. Just really go out and vote. And if you if you and have questions about who to vote for, there are those who try to protect fossil fuels, who try to protect coal mining, who try to protect... All these things that create a lot of CO2, which is one of the major culprits. So um, getting those out of office is, would be my personal recommendation. <laughs> I can just second that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we have, uh, we have to, to make sure as well that uh, the, uh, the, the votes are not going to, to politicians who uh, make the interest of, uh, of those lobbies. That's, that's, uh, that's one of the big problems. Anyway, yeah. um, Anyways, think, on this happy note. Yeah, on this happy note, I think we have come to the end of this episode. There's plenty more to talk to over the next um, weeks, months, and so on. And uh, until then, I think uh, we can agree that uh, there's lots to talk about. And that's what we're here for. And that's what we do. Uh, Most important, after, we are back. We're back after yeah. this summer, and um, we are we're uh, look, looking hard into making this a more regular thing again. <laughs> we're working on it. Well, anyway, until next time, take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.